follow up, uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I'm always pleased to introduce our near-death experiencer. And um, I was interested last uh, yesterday, Dick Dingus and Howard Storm, our speaker, and I were talking about near-death experiences and how there's more and more a body now of books and research and experiences that are have been coming together now 40 some 50 some years that are really adding to our mystical spiritual theological understanding that we that we all have we have near death experiences who talk to god and talk to jesus and talk to loved ones and family members on the other side and they bring that back and they tell their stories in in the first person i talked to god and god told me this you know so that's that's a revelation that that um, we're always pleased to share with you and we're thankful that that you um, that you are open to us and we're especially privileged today by having howard storm Howard is really well, well known for being in that first generation of near-death experiencers to write books about it, to talk about it. Uh, Howard was on the Oprah show and uh, Today show and, and numerous, numerous television and radio shows in the early days. He was part of that first generation with Raymond Moody and George Ritchie and others who first introduced the world to near-death experiences. So it's a great privilege. PM Atwater, we've, we've had at this podium, is another of those pioneers in the field of near-death experiences. I'm not going to tell uh, Howard's story. He's going to tell it to you this morning. A Bostonian and a delightful man, a pastor now, Howard Storm. Dick promised to be responsible for keeping me on time. Right, Dick? <laughs> um, no problem? All right. I'll, I'll go until midnight. Um, I want to begin by repeating the prayer that you began this service with. Shema Israel Adonai Alehu Adonai Ahad Right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. That's what I said in Hebrew. Um, I took a class in that, just that part. Three credit class at seminary, graduate level class in that. We could talk about that for months, about how full of meaning that is, the oneness of God. But as I think you all appreciate in that prayer of the oneness of God, you're a part of it. You're part of that oneness. And that's what my sense is. I, you know, I, I only know about this church from being here for a few minutes, and I, I love it. I, w I, wish, I wish this church, there were, I wish there were a million people there, and I wish I was serving a church like this in Kentucky. Um, there is no such thing in Kentucky. You, I hate to admit it, but I think you might be right. Maybe unique. <laughs> Which is not right. It's just not right because what you all are promoting, to the best of my understanding, is what is true and good. I'm not going to tell my story. Um, I did it yesterday. Um, what I want to tell you is I'm going to, I want to tell you to the very best of my ability what Yeshua told me. So what I'm going to do, to, and I, you know, Christ is with me, he's with you, he's here. We're two or more, I mean, he's suspecting you, and two or more gathered in my name, there you all shall be. Um, and I can't mess up. I mean, if I mess up, he's gonna want me, you know, right? No, he's not. He loves me. He's just gonna say, really, Howard? Come on, you can do better than that. Um, I don't like to disappoint him. I have been trying to live a life pleasing to God. That's it. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm a mess. I screw up. You know, I've had impure thoughts. <gasps> um, 
I want to live a life pleasing to God. When people ask me what should they do, I said, try and live a life pleasing to God. You know, that's it. That's all you have to do. And let it, let it all go. You know, let everything else go. Let go of the guilt and the doubts and the angers and the unforgiveness and the vengeance and, you know, the um, beating yourself up. Just let all that go and just live and live it joyfully in a way that you think might be pleasing to God. And, and that means living fully, right? Did God give us this life to bloom or to shrivel? When I asked Jesus the meaning of life, I said, you know, it was early in the conversation, I want to start, I get, get started with my conversation with Jesus, uh, the biggie, I said, so what's the meaning of life? Why were we created? And he gave me this big, huge, very esoteric, philosophical explanation. And I totally didn't get it. Um, and there's good reasons why I didn't get it, because although I was a, um, our professor in the university, I, I you know, didn't have a real, I didn't have a real philosophical background, and he was speaking beyond my understanding. And I said, I don't understand you. I don't understand what you're saying. Explain it to me in a real simple way so I can understand it. And this is what he told me. He said, it's like a garden. Sound like something we talked about in the meditation this morning. <laughs> it's like a garden. And that God planted us all here to bloom and to be fruitful and to be beautiful. Went, oh, yeah, I can, I can handle that. I got, you know, <laughs> you're speaking to my mentality now. <laughs> you know, nice and simple. What's so wrong with simple? You know, simple... If you look up in the dictionary, it has different definitions. It can be used in a pejorative way, like, boy, it's so simple. Um, you know, the other definitions of simple is honest, straightforward, clear, right? Those are the other meanings of simple. And God is honest, straightforward, and clear. If you read stuff that obfuscates the meaning of God, I suggest to you, it's not from God or it's been terribly misunderstood. God, the, the real stuff from God is pretty direct and simple. Um, as the Christ Yeshua spoke, spoke right in simple, simple ways to the, to the hearing and understanding of um, a relatively uneducated people. Just as the Psalms speak right to the heart of, of, of the whole human experience. If you read the Psalms, you know, they, they, they describe practically the entire human experience. Um, so, the future of the world. We'll start off with something easy. <laughs> you t he told me, don't hold back. You're going to regret this. <laughs> no, you're not. Didn't he? Uh, don't you love that guy? I love that guy. Yeah. I love that guy. Um, he's, His name is Lloyd. Lloyd. <laughs> hey, Lloyd. Um, I'm terrible with names. I have a visual memory. I can remember faces, but no names. Anyways. said, so what's going to happen? Um, this was in 85 when I had the experience. I was... Uh, uh, First, I was born in 46, beginning of the baby boom. My father just come back from Pego Pego, New Guinea in the United States Navy and like, whew, made me. <laughs> when he got home, I like to think maybe I'm the first thing he did. <laughs> Been saving up for a while. Um, and he did not enjoy being in Pego Pego, New Guinea, by the way. He hated it, every moment of it. Um, so, I grew up in the um, nihilism and horror of the Cold War, you know, which resulted in, seriously, which resulted in the Beatnik movement, which I was a part of in Harvard Square, and then down in, I went down to New York to the village when I was 15 years old and lived down there for, for months. 
turtleneck, bongo drums. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> you the bongo man. <laughs> Wellington boots. Um, army jacket. Right? Um, you know, those were the days of you know, Bob Dylan and stuff like that. Um, and that morphed into the hippie thing. I was since I moved to San Francisco in '66 before the word hippie had ever been coined, and lived there till '69, and then went to Berkeley in '69 and was there till '72. Thank you, thank you. And for those that, uh, for those of you that didn't say right on, I won't tell you what that one means. Do you know, Lloyd? You know what that means? Oh, never mind. Untranslatable in the human. Oh, she knows. Um, in the human language. Um, so, my point of giving you that little bit of autobiographical information is like, my sense of the future was totally pessimistic. Basically, the bottom line is we were going to blow ourselves up. Um, and when I say blow ourselves up, I'm talking the whole shimoli. I'm talking the amoebas and the microbes, you know, and the worms and the scorpions and, you know, obviously the pe people are very fragile, they'd be the first ones off with nuclear weapons. Because at the time, you, I can't remember the numbers, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to fabricate this, but, you know, the U.S. had something 60 or 70,000 nuclear weapons and the Russians had a comparable number, enough, you know, to make the prophetic movies of the time like On the Beach. And if you remember On the Beach? That, that, that was the vision of the future, and there, there were others, you know. Jesus said, there's not going to be any nuclear war. I said, oh really? Uh, how's that going to happen? He said, God will not allow human beings to destroy this planet. He didn't say God's not going to allow human beings to destroy humans. And I said, why won't God allow nuclear war to destroy the planet? He said, because God has made this world. This is, all, this is all God's creation. God loves every flower, every tree, every blade of grass, every worm, every mosquito, every bird, every giraffe. You know, this is, this is not our stuff. Um, if you'd read more of the creation story, you know, our purpose here is to be stewards of the earth, to care for the earth, and not to destroy the earth. And as you all know, we are... Um, subtly, not so subtly, destroying the earth. And God will not let us destroy this earth with nuclear war. I said to Jesus, will God, if someone launched a missile, reach down and snatch it out of the sky and destroy it? And he said, of course he would. God's not going to, just God, God is not going to let a nuclear war happen. And I said, not even a little bit. He said, what God is going to allow us, there's going to be some nuclear, ac nuclear accidents to show humanity that this nuclear stuff is bad news and that they need to dispose of it. So I said, so what is going to happen? And he said, the, the, what God wants to happen is worldwide conversion into a world of peace and love where the Spirit of God, which I hope you don't need me to translate, but I'll translate this into another word, the Spirit of Christ will be in every heart, mind and soul. He did not say, and I don't understand that mean everybody's going to go to Christian church. He didn't say that and I don't believe that he that's the intention. It's not about religion. It's about heart. Maybe in the future, you know, and I can make a, a scriptural case for this, maybe in the future there won't even be any churches. But if you mean by church a formal building, maybe the church will just be the community which is actually closer to the, you know, because the word church comes to the Greek ecclesia, meaning those called, right? It's a Greek term, those called. So maybe in the future, the church will simply be those called together, you know, because of their mutual love of God and their mutual interest. So, um, the coming of Christ, according to my understanding, now you notice I'm, telling, I'm, I'm switching this from like Jesus' lips to my thoughts is the coming of Christ in the future is the reign of Christ, the, the kingdom of God, 
when it's in everybody's heart. And that, and by that, by that, you, of course, you know that I mean more than Europeans. And you know the interesting thing is that it looks like the signs of that. If you're studying what's happening in the world, is it's happening more in Africa, and it's happening more in Asia, and it's happening more in South America, and it's happening less in Europe and America. You know, look look at what's going on around the world. I am so excited because in May I'm supposed to go to Kenya. Um, I got invited by an African who, an African preacher came came to my home in Kentucky and begged me to go to Kenya and work with him. And I, so I'm, I'm going in May, and uh, I hope God willing. And he's telling me the enthusiasm the enthusiasm is blowing going to blow me away because. Don't, don't take this personal. I, I'm not being critical of you guys. I don't know you guys. I, I'm already complimenting you. You look pretty cool to me. But my general experience that the love of God, the love of Christ, the enthusiasm for um, the inner light creating a new world, my experience is it's just not there. Generally. That's my anecdotal experience. I'm sorry to say that. I mean, you, you guys are exceptional. The people that I meet that are into this stuff, they're the exception. They're, the, they're the maybe one out of a hundred. I don't know what statistically what's correct, but they're, they're the few and far between. And I know the reception that I get when I speak about this stuff uninvited is hostility. Overt hostility. Do you, get, do you guys get that? Yeah. And that's why you, you kind of feel like a subversive because you go around you can only talk to people who you feel like are willing to accept the possibility that love is the most important thing in the world. That there is hope for the world. That there is some supreme being that's behind all. I mean, you know, like, <laughs> you kind of, we almost feel like it's the, the Roman Empire and you know, and somehow we're opposed to the emperor. Well, it is because the world is ruled by materialism and we're in opposition to that world. So I said to Jesus, I just don't see how that's going to come about. And he said, one person at a time, love, it's going to happen. It's God's will. It will happen. When will it happen? 200 years. Now, that was in 18, 1985, so um, it's not so far off. You know, I've got um, six kids, and right now, and you know, and my, my kids are, um, I, got, I got kids, children that still aren't even married yet, so potential for them. I got 10 grandkids from a attorney, my oldest, <laughs> to um, a baby that was born a couple weeks ago, um, you know, the whole range in between. I don't care about me. I, I, I'm ready to go. God, you know, like, well, I, I would welcome it if I were right now, right? I mean, it'd be cool with me. I'm, I am good to go. Well, when the saints go, you know, we, get, we practice the music. Let's, <laughs> you know, I'm good. I don't care about me anymore. I don't, I don't mean, you're shaking your head. Thank you, because you know that I, I'm not saying that. It's not BS. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm done. I'm good to go. But I do care about those babies. You know, they haven't had a chance to blossom yet. You know what I mean? Because they're beautiful. They're so beautiful. Um, so I said to Jesus, what if it doesn't work out the way that God plans it, which is a peaceful conversion rule. I, I just want to backtrack for a minute. I had talked to uh, Jesus about the Cold War. Okay, you're going to think I'm making this up, but I'm, I'm not making anything up. Um, I asked to Jesus about the Cold War in 1985. 1985. Some of you put your head back to 1985. It was the height of the Cold War. There was no peace in sight. And Jesus said, Cold War is going to be done in a couple of years. There's going to be um, a throwing off of communism throughout the whole Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. 
and they're just going to stop being communists, and it's going to be peace between the East and the West. And I told Jesus he was wrong, because, of course, I know more than he does. And he said, you're wrong. I'm right. It's going to happen. Well, I did tell people this stuff in 1985 after my experience, and I did, you know, there, there's some proof that I said this stuff back then. Well, you all know what happened was, in Leipzig, Germany, a pastor started a prayer group in 1985 with six people, which eventually turned into 300,000 people, and the um, German secret police sent the troops out to break it up, and the secret police went to this prayer group, this, and I'm, I'm up to 87 or 88 here, went to this prayer group and they're like, we can't, we, how can we arrest 300,000 people? And they're only praying. I mean, it's like, and so the then President Jerry said, I'll leave him alone. And the Berlin Wall fell. In Hungary, a reformed church pastor started a prayer group. And the Ceausescu family, really terrible uh, group of, you know, dictators, tried to arrest them. And the Romanian Communist Party fell. That's the story, you know, Czechoslovakia, all, all, all over Eastern Europe, and Gorbachev. Um, communism, the hostility between the East and the West collapsed in the late 80s. Now, of course, then we have politicians that come along and say they did. They did not do it. They may have made a tiny contribution. It was normal people and doing like absolutely insane, foolish, worthless, stupid stuff like praying and getting together and praying really hard. You know, which of course most people laugh at as useless, but like they brought, they brought it down. I asked Jesus, what if this peaceful plan of conversion of the world doesn't go your way? Jesus did not say this, but I'm, I'm going to give you in a simple way what he told me, which God's going to press the reset button. God will allow a global economic collapse, which will reduce the population of the earth down to a tiny little fraction, and that remnant will start with a strong faith and love in God and a world of peace and harmony will reign and everybody else would have been wiped out. Now, God does not want option two. He wants option one. But God never, ever, ever manipulates or controls. Control is one of the great marks of evil. Con Control is how evil tries to enforce its will. You know, if you, if you want to um, do spiritual discernment about whether a politician or a government or a plan is a good plan or a bad plan, if the plan is about controlling people, then you know it's not a godly plan. Because a godly plan is about people working cooperatively and working, working cooperatively and working in love, etc. So, um, that, and, that's, and so anyways, I asked Jesus to show me what that world was like, because of the time, I'm not going to go into it, but paradise, absolute paradise, a world of love and peace and um, music, really big in that world. You, you'll like it, <laughs> but you, you won't be, not around for that one, but you'll like heaven, because music's big up there too. Um, people living very, very simple lives in harmony with the planet, um, complete telepathic communication globally and intergalactically because, as I'm sure you all know, the whole universe is full of intelligent life. This is one of the most backward, low, crudest planets in the whole creation, and there are millions of planets where people have evolved to godliness, harmony, and that's the fate of this world, is to get there. Um, 
asked Jesus, so like what, what's the deal in heaven? Where do, where do we go to? And in heaven, anything good, anything beautiful, anything right is in heaven. Anything that ever was, is, or will be. And if you want to know it, be a part of it, it's yours. Anything you want to know, all you have to do is like question something and that knowledge will be given to you. But here's the interesting thing. You'll come to realize that knowing stuff is not really important because what really rules heaven is God's love. And that's what we will all crave and thirst and yearn for more of that love until we are completely completely totally filled with that love and when we are filled with that love we are then qualified to be part of what I would refer to as the heavenly orchestra which used to be referred to as the heavenly choir um, we were created to be participants some people call it co-creators I don't like the term co-creator because it suggests an equality. God is the composer and conductor of the creation. So, if you join an orchestra, you're not writing the orchestration, right? You're trying to follow the conductor and the script, right? So that's, that's why the term co -creator. But we are participating with the creator because the individual have you ever noticed we're all like weirdly individualistic well that individuality is God's plan because each and this is Jesus told me each of us brings our instrument which is our uniqueness to the orchestra so your instrument and your instrument are who you are and I'm not when I say instrument I'm not talking about an oboe or a guitar or a piano or whatever I'm talking about your your very being your creative being is who you are and that's unique and you bring that to the orchestra but only those who are filled with the love of God get to be part of that creation and then some people are given tasks to be over the angels you know there's like billions and billions and billions, trillions of angels all over the universe how many of you have met at least one angel if not more Okay, a large number of people. Well, there's a, there's a lot more angels than, I mean, this, this room's full of angels if we could see them. Anyhow, angels all over the world. Angels are servants of God. But people who have been uh, beings like us um, ultimately get put in charge of angels. And so... Um, Sometimes it's um, cities, and sometimes it's nations, and sometimes it's planets, and sometimes it's solar systems, and sometimes it's galaxies. So there are greater and greater and greater responsibilities. None of these beings would ever consider equality with God to be something. And I'm telling you that when I talk to the angels, they told me, never worship us. We do not want that. Only God is to be worshipped. And God doesn't want us to abase ourselves in worship. And we celebrate God like we should celebrate death. Um, just a quick aside, I'm running out of time. As a pastor, I've done hundreds of funerals. Not one of the fun parts of the job. You know, I'd much rather do weddings and baptisms because those are fun. Uh, funeral, funerals are tough because um, there's a lot of hurting people and like trying to be as compassionate as possible I cannot um, completely wall myself off from the pain and the grief that they're experiencing so like when I'm doing a funeral you know the front oh I'm sorry the front, the front row is like right there you know when the arms reach me right you know the spouses the kids the parents whatever you ever do a funeral for a baby? Okay. Awful. Horrible. I mean, I, I, can barely, I can barely get through it because of the pain. But on the other hand, 
I want, to, I want everybody, let's be happy and rejoice because they've graduated. Because this is, this is school. What don't you understand about school? Everybody in this room's been in school. And like, hopefully you successfully worked your way through it somehow and you've moved beyond, well, this is school. And when we leave this world, we've left this school and then we go on to a whole nother level of being. Um, this is a very, very simple experiential learning school. And, you know, I'm going to, you know, if you want an A plus on the test, I'll give you the question. There's only one question. And the question is, what's the curriculum? The curriculum is love, okay? If you put that, if you do put that down on the test, you get an A plus, right? And if you say, screw that, it's about me and my gratification, you get to go to remedial school <laughs> and it's no fun down there it's, it's bad down there they're not nice I mean people even call it hell whatever you want to call it it's just not fun and God's hope is that at some point somehow they're going to wake I mean I've done some work in prisons and like you know, some people get that maybe they could have a better life than spending it in prison, and some haven't figured that out yet. I think that sooner or later they would, you know, many of them ultimately come to the conclusion that there's an alternative to living in prison, right? Living in a place of hopelessness and despair. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, which is four times, oop, count them four times, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Four times in the Bible, and there's no there's no follow oops, sorry there's no follow up on that there's no conditions on that there's no and the secret name of God is booga booga said eighteen times in a low time you know it does, it it just says anyone who calls so if your name for the Lord is whatever right that's the, that's God is far beyond language. Because God knows what's in the heart. He doesn't care about dogma and theology. When, okay, I'm going to tell you something that Jesus told me. I shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. So don't quote me because I'll deny I ever said it. Um, God has no interest in our dogma and theology because it's all stupid, ignorant, elementary, crude. The real Theology, which, you know, the, theosology, study of God, is so far, far beyond our ability to, you know, with our cultural background, with our language limitations, to actually conceptualize. I mean, it's not that it's inaccurate. We, we don't even know how to encapsulate in the language skills that we have. Does that make sense? And... Jesus told me this, and I was also told the very same thing in seminary, at a Methodist seminary, that you can't actually really talk about God because language can't talk about God. So, um, we do what we have to do. You know, as the uh, Buddhists say, um, before enlightenment, haul wood and carry water. After enlightenment, Paul would carry water. <laughs> so that's what I'm. That's what I'm doing. I'm 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 hauling the wood and I'm carrying the water, and you are a blessing to me, right? So I hope that my little shtick here has blessed you. God bless you.